I, I want you to turn with me to Job, the 14th chapter, and the 14th verse. Job, the 14th chapter, and the 14th verse. Now, Job is in the Old Testament, and uh, it's the oldest book in the world. There is no known book in the world as old as the book of Job. And yet Job asked a question that I'm sure disturbs many of you tonight. He asked a question that every great philosopher has wrestled with. He asked a question that every great thinker and intellectual at some time wrestles with. He asked the same question that one of the greatest scientists in this country asked me about three weeks ago. He said, science knows nothing about it, but he said, I'm disturbed about it and worried about it. Here is the question. If a man die, shall he live again? If a man die, shall he live again? The problem of death and life, or life and death, haven't you ever thought about that? You've been to a funeral. For a few moments, you're solemn, you're thoughtful. That night, you go back, you go to bed, you think about it. One of these days, they're going to be taking me out to the cemetery. They'll be saying some words over me. Is that the end? Is it all over? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die. Birth is a happy event. Death is a tragic event. And we have tears. You take the fifth chapter of Genesis and you'll see the list of all those men that lived to be old men. Adam lived 930 years, but he died. Methuselah lived 969 years, but he died. I read about a man the other day in Brazil that they claim lived 134 years. But he died. At the end of every life is death. Life is very brief. The Bible says it's a tale that is told. It's a weaver's shuttle. It's a flower that fades. It's like the grass that withers. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow expressed it once when he said, Art is long and time is fleeting. And our hearts, though stout and brave, Still like muffled drums of beating, funeral marches to the grave. And that's exactly where we're all headed. It is appointed unto man once to die. Thou shalt die and not live. Now the great question is, are you ready to meet God? Because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, but after that, the judgment. There is something after death according to this book. Now again, I say I can't take you to a scientific laboratory and prove it to you. But this book teaches from Genesis to Revelation that this life is only a preparation room for eternity. There is another life. The Old Testament teaches it. The New Testament teaches it. Jesus taught it. The apostles taught it. If a man dies, shall he live again? That's the question Job asked. That's the question that millions are asking tonight. And the answer from the Bible is a resounding yes. Yes. There is a life after death. If a man dies, shall he live again? Cicero, the great Roman, said, Upon this subject I entertain no more than conjecture. I've spent a great deal of my life searching for the answer. Mrs. Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, in one of her columns a few years ago said, It's instinctive for man to believe in life after death. And it is. You never find a tribe anywhere in the world. You never find a culture. You never find a civilization anywhere in history that didn't believe in some form of life after death. And when the early forefathers and pilgrims came to this country, they thought they had found some tribes in New England that didn't believe, tribes of Indians that didn't believe in life after death. But they soon found when they communicated with them that they believed in the happy hunting ground. Yes, man instinctively, something down inside says there must be a future life. 
There must be something beyond this life. But after all, there's only one authoritative person that can speak on this subject. Because he came from the grave. He rose. And his name was Jesus Christ. About two or three years ago, I had the privilege of having an interview with, Con uh, with Chancellor Conrad Adenauer in his last year in office as Chancellor of Germany. He had invited me. I was preaching in Germany, and he had invited me to come and see him, and I didn't know what about. I was quite surprised and, of course, flattered to get the invitation. And I went. He greeted me. Big, tall, giant of a man. The man that had almost single-handedly brought democracy back to Germany after the war. And I wondered, what does this great man want of me? The first question he asked me was this. He said, do you believe in life after death? I said, yes, sir, I do. I said, I believe the Bible teaches it. He said, I do too. He said, I am studying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he said, when I leave office as chancellor, I intend to spend the rest of my life studying the resurrection of Christ because he said, if Christ is alive, there is hope in the world. He said, if Christ is not alive, there is no hope that I can see that civilization can be saved. Wasn't that something? Yes, Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead, and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body, they saw the angel sitting there, and they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof, and there is, I would still believe it because I believe this book is God's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire, that a man had risen from the dead, that he was alive, that death could not hold him. Christ is alive. He's a living Savior. And yet many of his followers and Christians live and act as though he's dead. He's not dead. He's alive. And the Bible says that at a given moment, a given signal, he's coming back to this earth to set up his kingdom. And what a kingdom it's going to be. It'll be a world in which there will be no tears and no sorrow and no death. There'll be no suffering. There'll be no war, there'll be no police forces, there'll be no armies. It's going to be a glorious world ruled by one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's alive. I've given my life not to a dead Christ, but to a living Christ. And I'm following a living Savior. And he's given me a song to sing. He's given me a flag to follow. He's given me something to believe. I have reason for existence. I know where I've come from. I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going. Do you? God said, Hezekiah, get your house in order. You're going to die. Now, you and I are going to die because, you see, the Bible teaches that you and I have a body. But living inside of our body is the real you. You're a real person. And that's the part of you that lives forever. Your body is going to go to the grave.
But you, the real you, your intelligence, your memory, your personality is going to live forever and ever. According to the Bible, you will never die. And you're going to spend a million years, a billion years, in one of two places, according to Jesus. Not according to Billy Graham, but according to Jesus. Jesus talked a great deal about heaven, but he talked three times more about hell than he did heaven. The other writers of the Bible don't have too much to say about hell, but Jesus talked about it all the time. In the Sermon on the Mount, I've had fellows say, I don't believe in hell, I live by the Sermon on the Mount. Well, you've never read the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talked about it. Now, what did he mean by it? He said, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. What did he mean? Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. What did he mean? He is saying that hell was never made for man. He is saying that God will never send anybody to hell. If man goes to hell, he goes by his own free choice. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for man. God never meant that a man should go there. And God has done everything within his power to keep you out. He even gave his son to die on that cross to keep you out. Because you see, when God made you, he made you a free moral agent. You can live any kind of life you want to. You can live a good life, you can live a bad life. You can break God's laws, you can obey them. You can shake your fist in God's face and there's nothing God can do. Because when he created you, he gave you a gift of free choice. You're not a robot that he push you, you push a button and you jump and obey. You've got a right to resist God, to reject God. But the Bible says, in spite of our rebellion and rejection, God loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his son to die for your sins. And when Christ died on that cross, we don't understand all that happened on that cross. But we know one thing, that he took the hell and the judgment that you deserved and I deserved because of our sins. He took it on that cross. And that's why that terrible expression comes from his lips, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because you see, the very meaning of hell is separation from God. And in that terrible moment, a shadow passed between God the Father and God the Son for the first time since eternity began. Christ dying for you, and he suffered the pangs of hell. He became guilty of lying. He became guilty of slander. He became guilty of jealousy. He became guilty of the most filthy, dirty sins. And when those sins came into his soul, your sins and my sins came into his soul, God could not look. Because God cannot look upon iniquity. God is so holy. Christ took the hell that you and I deserved on that cross. Now God said, receive him, believe in him, put your trust and your confidence in him, and I will forgive your sins, and I will guarantee you eternity in a place called heaven. It's all yours, and it's all free. All you have to do is receive it. What an offer. He offers you tonight eternal life. Now, eternal life doesn't begin the moment you die. Now, when you die, as a Christian, eternal life doesn't begin there. Eternal life begins the moment you receive Christ. Now, many of you here in South Carolina and in North Carolina and all over the country have been reared in Christian homes. 
or you go to a church. You live a fairly decent life, and you're sort of living on the reflected afterglow of your parents' religion. But you've never really received Christ for yourself. You've never really trusted him for yourself. You don't know him really. You're not really sure that you're ready to meet God. And the Bible says, prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared? Are you sure you're prepared? You know, the Bible says these things I write unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I can stand here tonight without being egotistical, without being conceited. I can stand here tonight and say to you on the authority of this book, I know my sins are forgiven. I know I'm going to heaven. I know that I'm going to live as long as God lives because the moment I receive Christ, I became a partaker of God's own life. Now I'm going to live a billion years, and I'll only have begun. I know that, not because of any goodness of my own. I'm not going to heaven because I've lived a good life. I'm not going to heaven because I've preached to great crowds of people. I'm going to heaven because of what Christ did on that cross. For by grace are ye saved, through faith, that not of yourselves not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not going to heaven because we're good. We're not going to heaven because we work. We're not going to heaven because we pay. We're going to heaven because of what he did on the cross, and all I have to do is receive it. And it's so simple to receive Christ that millions stumble over its very simplicity. You see, God made it so simple that children can believe. He made it so simple and so easy that a blind man, a deaf man, a dumb man, can believe. A man of any race can believe. A man of any nationality, of any language can believe. And that's all God says you have to do to get to heaven. Just believe. Now that word believe is a little more than maybe you think it is. It means commitment. It means surrender. It means that I give everything I have to Jesus Christ and trust him alone for my forgiveness and my salvation. It means that the moment you receive him, your name is written in the book of life. Is your name in the book of life? Are you sure you're going to heaven? Are you prepared to meet God? If there's the slightest doubt in your heart tonight that you're prepared to meet God, don't you dare leave here without settling it. Why? Because you may never have another hour or another moment like this. You can't come to Christ any time you want to. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off that without remedy. Thousands of people have prayed for this crusade. The Spirit of God has brought you here. Hundreds of people have come to Christ already in this crusade. The way is prepared. Your heart is prepared. The Spirit of God is speaking tonight. This is the hour. This is the moment. And you may never have this moment quite like this again. I'm going to ask you to commit your life to Christ, to make sure that your name is written in the book of life, to make sure that you're going to heaven, and to receive tonight eternal life. And here's the way we're going to do it. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you, get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform right now, quietly and reverently. I'm going to ask that nobody leave the service, please. Get up out of your seat, men, women, young people. You may be members of the church. You may be an usher. You may be a choir member. Get up out of your seat and come and stand here. And after you've stood here, I'm going to say a word to you. Have a prayer give you some literature, you can go back and join your friends. That's all there is to it. But it's very important that you come and make this public declaration. Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. You get up and come right now. There's something about coming forward that settles it and seals it in your heart. You get up and come quickly. And I'm going to ask that everyone be in prayer. Bow your heads and pray. Pray for the person to the right of you and left of you and back of you and front of you. Perhaps no one ever prayed that they would come to Christ before. Many people are already on the way. You get up and join them and come. What an hour and what a moment for you to come to Christ. We're going to wait as you come. Leaving the service now in just a moment, you can make the same commitment 
and the same decision that these are making and the same Christ that will come into their hearts and give them assurance will do the same for you. You may be sitting at a bar somewhere. Maybe you're in your living room at home or maybe you're in a friend's home. Maybe you're in some unusual place that I couldn't even think of at the moment. And you need Christ and you need God in your life. You can receive him right now and he can bring about a tremendous change. And then go to church on Sunday. Have a talk with a minister. Tell him the decision that you've made. And get to work for Christ. And live in this brand new dimension of living. The spiritual dimension. Good night and God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. We are to wait for the coming of Christ with patience. patience. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to talk on fools. And I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning with the 18th verse. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. A couple years ago, Anthony Newley sang, What kind of a fool am I? To the top of the charts. And uh, I looked up in the dictionary to see what a fool is, or one of my associates did for me. And the Bible has a lot to say about fools and what a fool is. Proverbs 10, 21, it says, fools die for the want of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7 says, fools despise wisdom. Uh, when P.T. Barnum came to this country many years ago, he said, the American people want to be fooled and I'm here to fool them. He said, a fool is born every minute. And uh, now synonyms that you can find for the word fool is stupid person, bonehead, blockhead, simpleton, chump, nitwit, goose, sap, numbskull, ignoramus, beetlehead, whatever you want. <laughs> a one who has been imposed on by others, a stooge, a gullible, or a dupe. Now in the Bible, it may mean all of this, but it also has a moral meaning in the Bible and is a very important word in the Bible. And the verses seem almost paradoxical. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Let him become a fool. And Proverbs 1.7 says, Fools despise wisdom. And God is speaking from the divine standpoint. In one passage, the fool is an unthinking, thoughtless, careless person without true understanding. In the other passage, the word fool is used from the standpoint of people who have received Christ because the world laughs at them and says they're foolish and ridiculous. They're fools. So there are unwise fools and they're wise fools. Now Jesus said, whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. You be very careful how you call another person a fool. I wouldn't dare use that name for you or for anybody else. 
Never use the word fool in anger, the Bible says. But I'm telling you what God says about it in certain instances. First, there's the atheistic fool. It's repeated twice in Psalm 53, 1 and Psalm 14, 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But in Hebrew, it actually means there is no God for me. In other words, the, this fool deliberately says there is no God for me. He's not saying there's no God. He's saying there's no God for me. Then there's the practical atheist. You see, there are many people that are really not atheist, but they are practical atheist in the sense that they live like an atheist. You profess to believe in God, but you don't live like you believe in God. You live as though there is no God. You too, in a sense, are an atheist. And there are hundreds here tonight like that. You believe in God with your mind. You may go to church, but you live as though God does not exist as far as you're concerned. And so you are an atheist in a sense. And then secondly, the Bible talks about the mocking fool, the mocking fool. Fools make a mock of sin, Proverbs 14, 9. Here is God in all of his holiness. And the Bible tells us that we've sinned against him. We've broken his laws and we're under the sentence of death. We're under the sentence of death. I saw a film tonight on television on one of the news programs telling how many men and women are on death row in the United States right now. Under the sentence of death. All of us here tonight are under the sentence of death. The wages of sin is death. And we have all sinned and broken the laws of God. And so we're all sentenced to die. We are to die physically. The graveyards are full of, full of people that are there because sin caused death. And then sin also causes spiritual death. Your soul is dead. Your spirit is dead. Physically you're alive, but your soul that lives inside your body is dead toward God. So you're a walking dead person under the sentence of death. And the only way that you can have that sentence lifted is to come to Christ by repentance of sin and faith in Him as your Lord and your Savior. If you would like that sentence lifted, if you would like your sins wiped out as though they had never existed, if you would like to be justified in the sight of God, pick up that telephone right now, you that are watching by television. Pick it up and call the number that you see on your screen and a counselor will answer. And the counselor will talk to you about how you can come to know Christ. As many people here tonight I hope and believe and pray, will find Christ as their Lord and Savior. But there are many people that make a mockery of sins. They mock God's standards, God's standards of sex, God's standards of marriage, God's standards concerning divorce and ethics and morality and social justice. We make a mockery of it. We laugh at it. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Don't ever doubt it. Your sin... Your sin will find you out, though no one on earth may discover it. You may never be caught. You may never have to pay for it here, as far as you can tell. But your sin will someday be found out. No one ever commits one sin that isn't found out. Everything that you did in the darkness, every evil thought that you ever had is going to be found out because it'll all be recorded it's being recorded awaiting the judgment day. It's being recorded on tape machines, far more sophisticated than anything we have. It's being recorded. Even your thoughts and your sins will find you out and it'll be exposed to the whole universe. Will find you out. Will. It's only a question of time. The word will is definite. Will find you out. Find, perhaps you've deceived everyone else, your wife, your family, your church, your friends, but the Bible says your sin will definitely find you out. A detective at last, after running away so long and hiding so long, God's hand will come on your shoulder and say, I have found you. You've been found out. We now know. And then, thirdly, there's the slandering fool, the slandering fool. He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. 
passing along an evil story about others, maligning other people's character, wrecking their reputations by evil gossip. Gossiping is listed in the Bible as one of the worst of all sins. And yet how frequent that's done even in circles that call themselves Christians. It's a terrible sin in the sight of God, and God says that person is a fool. You wouldn't think of killing a person with a gun or a knife. But then many times we assassinate a character or try to pull someone down or to get even or because of jealousy by whispering innuendos. Someone told me or he did thus and so. We commit murder by character assassination, worse than killing a man with a pistol, a knife, or a club. He that uttereth a slander, the scripture says, is a fool. And then fourthly, there's the Christian fool. The Christian fool. Remember the road to Emmaus after Jesus Christ had died on the cross for our sins and he'd been raised again? And remember he was appearing to the disciples, in fact, 11 different appearances after his resurrection. And this is one of them. And these two disciples were on the way to Emmaus outside of Jerusalem. They were sad. They were disappointed. They were disillusioned. And they were mumbling and groaning among themselves. And another man joined them. And they didn't recognize who he was. And he talked to them, said, why are you so downcast? They said, oh, we thought he was to be the Messiah. Haven't you heard all the happenings in Jerusalem during the past week about this Jesus who did wonderful things? We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he'd come to save the world, but he didn't. He disappointed us. They killed him on a cross, and now the third day is passing. We heard rumors that he might be raised from the dead, but we don't accept that. And then Jesus said, Oh, fools, you're fools. Then he started expounding to them the scriptures from Moses through the prophets as to who he really was. And then he went to spend the evening with them and he was sitting at the meal in their home in Emmaus. And all of a sudden their eyes were open and they saw it was Jesus. In other words, the Christian fool who has the word of God in his hand, who reads his testimony and yet doubts the promises of God. Jesus said, oh, you fools, for not believing the scriptures that he was going to rise from the dead and someday he's coming back. And then, fifthly, there's the covetous fool. And the story is told in Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus told the story about a rich man in his barns. You remember he built his barns and he said he was going to retire because he'd made enough money now? probably going to go to Southern California, Florida, come here to Idaho to this beautiful place and retire. He'd made enough money. And he said, soul, take thy knees, drink and be merry. And that night he had a heart attack. And when he was dying, there was a voice heard from heaven that said, thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. And the scripture says, Jesus said, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, he tried to find happiness in the wrong place, money. He ignored the power of influence in that no man liveth unto himself. He must have had a family. He disregarded death. He had made no provision for eternity. He had provision for his retirement. How many men and women I know who have planned for retirement, planned everything, but they haven't prepared to die and they die shortly after they retire? It's amazing. I've thought about that. Some people announce their retirement, you read two or three weeks later that they dropped dead of a heart attack. They thought they were going to have five or 10 or 15 or 20 years that they could just take it easy and enjoy life but it doesn't always work out that way. You better be sure that you have prepared to meet God. Every person who is more concerned about getting some of this world's goods and leaving out the preparation for eternity is a fool. Or the person who spends their time in social climbing or having pleasure more than eternal things is a fool in the sight of God. 
If you're not concerned about your home in heaven, you're not concerned about the riches that will never fail, not concerned about laying up treasure where moth and rust doth not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal, then you're a fool. If you'd ask this man, what is your name? Well, he'd say, my name's the rich man. Or I'm the prosperous man that you read about. Or I'm an eminent man. I'm a great man in the neighborhood. Or I'm a famous man. My name is in the paper all the time. Then ask God, Lord, what is this man's name? And the answer comes back, fool. He's a fool. That's his name. The rich man knew every name but the right one. He had been called by his family name, his given name, his ranks, his titles, his wealth, the flatteries of men. But in the sight of God, his name was Thou Fool. That's all we know about him, that he was just a rich fool that laid up treasures on earth but laid up nothing for heaven. And how many of us are in the same category? You may not be rich in the sense that this man was rich, but everybody in America is rich compared to Bangladesh and people that I've, where we've been in many places of the world, like in Africa, or as Victor was talking about in, in Vietnam, where he was a missionary for some years. Very few of you would stir if I would look out on this audience and say, fool, come here, I'd like to see you. How many of you would get up and come? <laughs> Very few, maybe nobody. But the Bible says, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment? Quickly, it can all end. Your dream house comes tumbling down. Trouble in the family. The wealth is gone. Here was a man, a multimillionaire perhaps, but standing a hand's breadth away from his own grave, counting on everything in this life, the happiness, the joy that this life could give him, and he's called in the Bible by Jesus a fool. And then seventhly, there's another kind of a fool, or sixthly, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. 1 Corinthians 1.18, But unto us which were saved it is the power of God. What the world counts foolish, we have rested our eternal salvation on. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, turn your back on the pleasures and the sensual lust and things of this world, people think you're a fool. The world that does not know Christ looks foolish to me. Why can't they see? Why can't they understand? I want to grab everybody I see on the street and everybody we pass, everybody in the hotel, I want to grab them and say, look here, Christ could change your life. I see their empty faces and I, I see the ho hear the hollow laughter. And I see them drinking, trying to drink their, themselves into some happiness or taking the drugs in that hollow stare that they have. And I say, oh, if I could only just shake them loose. But you see, only the Holy Spirit can do that. I cannot do the work of the Holy Spirit for him. The Holy Spirit must convict them of sin. He must also lift this veil that's over their minds. And so salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says. If anyone desires wisdom, let him take his place in identification with Jesus Christ. What the world calls foolish, I'm resting my salvation on the cross of Christ, no matter what the world may think of him or of me. We're fools for Christ's sake, willing for the world to look at us as out of our minds, willing to be accounted as the very offscoring of the earth because we've turned to Christ. Are you one of the devil's fools? Are you willing to be a fool for Christ's sake? The Bible says in Proverbs 12, the way of a fool is right in his own eye. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Which road are you on? The narrow road that leads to eternal life or the broad road that leads to destruction? You have to make a choice. The Scripture says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you going to continue to be a fool in the sight of God? 
or are you going to become another kind of fool, the Christ fool, that the world will call a fool and call foolishness? Because you see, when you come to Christ, there's a price to pay. And one of the prices you pay is being misunderstood by some members of your family, some people in the community, some people where you work or where you go to school. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, come and take up the cross and follow me. You see, the cross that you bear, the cross that you bear is identification with Christ. It's not some special sickness that you get or some trouble you get. It's identifying with Christ and letting people laugh at you and being willing for them to make sport of you if necessary for following Christ. That's your cross. And if you're not willing to take that cross, you cannot be his follower, he said. Are you willing to take that cross? Are you willing to turn your life totally over to Christ? Some of us have got one foot in heaven and one foot in in hell, as it were. One foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom of God. And we're straddling the fence. God does not allow fence straddlers. You cannot be a mugwomp. That's what a mugwomp is, a fence straddler. God, Christ does not allow that. He ar allows no neutrality. You can't not be both. You must come all out for him. And you'll find that all the way through the Bible. You'll find it all the way through the teachings of Jesus. A great crowd was following Jesus one day, and he turned and talked to them about the fact that he was going to die on the cross, and it said many followed him no more. Why? Because they couldn't take this talk of the cross. Do you want Christ in your heart? Pick up that telephone right now if you're watching by television. Talk to that counselor. Make that call. And if, you, if it's a busy signal, call again. They'll be there all evening, all over the country. And you can talk to somebody and receive Christ into your heart tonight. Because you see, when Christ died on the cross, it says that the crowd down below, the mob below, ridiculed and laughed. And they said, what a fool. You saved others, but you cannot save yourself. <laughs> And Jesus was hanging there. And in heaven, 72,000 angels, 10 legions drew their swords, ready to come and rescue him. But he said, no, I love them. And when he died on the cross, he took your sins. Every sin that you've ever committed, he took on that cross. He took your death penalty for you. And because he was the son of God, and because he was sinless, he could bear your sins. And God has accepted his death as a sin offering for our sins. So that when God looks at me now, he doesn't see Billy Graham the sinner. I am a sinner. I have sinned, but I've placed my sins under the blood of Christ. And the blood that was shed on the cross washes my sins away symbolically in the sight of God so that when God looks at me, he cannot see my sins. And God has a unique ability that you don't have. God can forget. And it says that he forgets your sins. In other words, the tapes are erased from the time you were born till the time you die. Because if one sin ever remained on those tapes, you'd never make it to heaven. God is righteous and holy. And before you can get into heaven, you must be righteous too. And the only way you can get any righteousness is to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he offers you that righteous clothing tonight free. You don't have to pay for it. But you have to do three things. You must repent of your sins. That means you're willing to change your way of life. You're willing to change completely and put Christ first in your life from this moment on. You may be a member of the church. You may be a Catholic, a Mormon, Jewish, Protestant, whatever you are. You need Christ and you want to make that commitment. I'm not asking you to join a church tonight, a specific church. I'm asking you to make sure that your sins are forgiven and that you're ready for heaven. First, repent. Second, receive him by faith into your heart. 
Faith means trust, total commitment. It means that he becomes the pilot of your plane or he becomes the driver of your car, of your life. You turn all the decision-making over to him. And that's a wonderful thing. You trust him for your salvation. And then the third thing, you're willing to obey him. Study the scriptures and pray and obey him and do what he says and be his follower no matter what the cost. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen hundreds of people at each service do so far. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming, I want to make that commitment. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know the sentence of death has been lifted. I want to know I'm going to heaven. Why do I ask you to come forward publicly? Because Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus said, now is the, or the scripture says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise that there'll ever be a tomorrow for you. It's tonight. I believe there are hundreds of people here tonight that may never have this moment again in your whole life in which you're so close to the kingdom of God. Just get up and come. Fathers, mothers, young people, hundreds of you. You want Christ in your heart tonight. You want to make that commitment. You get up and come quickly. And as people are coming forward here at the Coliseum, you make that telephone call right now. The number is on your screen and counselors are standing by ready to help you. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can see that here in Boise, Idaho, many people are coming to make this commitment to Christ tonight. You can make that commitment right now where you are. You may be in a bar room. You may be in a nightclub. You may be in a hotel room. You may be in your living room or in your bedroom. Just say yes to Christ and let him come into your heart. As you can see, men and women and boys and girls from all over the Colosseum have come forward tonight to commit their heart and life to Jesus Christ. This is also a time of decision for many of you. Until then, this is Cliff Barrow speaking for...